ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا صلوات ربي وسلامه ورحمته وبركاته عليه يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تسألون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الكلام كلام الله سبحانه وتعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار نعوذ به سبحانه من النار وما يؤدي إلى النار Indeed our praises belong and are due and they are for Allah سبحانه وتعالى along with any partner We laud him, we declare these praises We ask his aid and his assistance and we beg for his guidance and we seek his mercy and his pardon we seek refuge in Allah, the sublime and the exalted from the evils of our souls and from the consequences and the vices of our misdeeds. Those whom Allah misleads or those whom Allah guides, no one can mislead. And those who are misled by Allah can never be led aright. I bear witness and I testify that Allah, the sublime and the exalted, is the only deity of worship along with our any partner. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam is his chosen slave and the last of his sent prophets and messengers. Allah the sublime the exalted says, O mankind, be mindful, be dutiful, be watchful, be wary, 
Be conscious of your maker, of your Lord, of your creator. The one who brought you into existence from non-existence. The one who gave you light after darkness. Darkness of your mother's womb. Darkness of ignorance. Darkness of lack of knowledge and detailed guidance of Al-Islam. As the Prophet ﷺ tells us, which was narrated by Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in Sahih Muslim, that Allah the Mighty and the Majestic says, كُلُّكُمْ ضَالٌ إِلَّا مَنْ هَدَيْتُهُ فَاسْتَهْدُونِي أَهْدِكُمْ Each and every one of you is misled and astray, except for those whom I guide. Seek my guidance and I will give it to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fear your maker, be watchful, be wary of your creator who made you from darkness into light, from ignorance into knowledge, from the womb to the dunya. Be mindful of this one who made you from a single soul, from the ayat of Allah that prove his ultimate power and his infinite wisdom and omnipotence is that he made each and every one of us sitting in this masjid today from one soul. When is the last time you sat down and thought about that? That you come from one man and from one woman. And from these two human beings, Allah the sublime and the exalted created countless human beings of various different races and ethnicities, of languages and attitudes and dispositions. Allah the exalted, he then says, he allowed these men and these women, despite their color, their tongue, their race, despite their background and orientation, he allowed them to live in his land, to eat, to drink, to benefit from the shade, to benefit from the fire, from the warmth, and all of the bounties and blessings that Allah has endowed us with. He says, be mindful of Allah, the one whose name you mention when you demand your basic mutual rights and stay far from severing the ties of kin. For indeed Allah is a raqib. Allah is someone who hears, someone who sees, someone who is ever aware and all acquainted with that which you do, rather that which is in your breasts, that which is on your mind. Before you say it, before you speak it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي نُفُسِكُمْ Indeed, Allah knows what is in your souls. Do we realize this, brothers and sisters, not slam? Before you say the statement or the word that is haram, that is disliked, Allah knows it in your heart. Before you think of doing good and righteousness and piety, Allah knows what is in your heart. Allah is a raqib. Allah the sublime and the exalted he also tells us what is translated to mean, O oh, you who believe. This verse is more specific. Allah is not addressing everyone. Allah is not addressing all of his servants and his slaves, but he's addressing a select few, an elite team, a special group from among his servants, and they are those who have iman, those who are believers. And he orders them with that which he orders the non-believers with. He orders the elite with that which he orders the regular, normal servants with, and that is taqwa. Have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never die unless you are a Muslim. Do not die unless you're in the state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah the sublime and the exalted he also tells us, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah, and speak the truth. Be directing your words. Don't have two tongues. Do not make a promise and break it. Do not smile in your brother's face and hate him behind his back. Do not make ghiba. Do not make namima. Do not speak of falsehood. Speak the truth. Be directing your words. And if you do so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you of your sins and correct, mend, and recycle your bad deeds into good deeds. And the slave who obeys Allah, who submits to Allah, who follows the way of his apostle is the most successful, is the most triumphant. To proceed, the most truthful speech is that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an al-Azim. And the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his authentic sunnah. And the worst and the most evil and the most horrible things that one could possibly do in this deen is to take the perfect way of Muhammad, the beautiful way of Muhammad, the stellar guidance of Muhammad, and do something that's contrary. Make a novelty, make an innovation. Bring something that Muhammad didn't practice, his companions didn't practice. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq never knew of this. Umar ibn Khattab he never heard of this act, or this practice, or this belief. And you bring something new. You bring something as if Muhammad forgot. As if Allah didn't send down the perfection of the religion. For every single mu'dafa is bid'ah. 
And each and every single bid'ah is misguidance. And all misguidance is in the fire of hell, that horrible place. We seek our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's refuge therefrom. قال الإمام أحمد رحمه الله في مسنده حدثني يزيد بن هارون قال حدثنا حديث قال حدثنا صليم بن عامر عن أبي أمامة قال إن فتى شابا أتى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال يا رسول الله إذنني بالزنا فأقبل القوم عليه فزجروه وقالوا مه مه قال ادنوا فدنا منه قريبا قال أتحبه لأمك قال لا والله جعل الله فداءك قال ولا الناس يحبونه لأمهاتهم قال أفتحبه لابنتك قال لا والله يا رسول الله جعل الله فداءك قال ولا الناس يحبونه لبناتهم قال أفتحبه لأختك قال لا والله جعل الله فداءك قال ولا الناس يحبونه لأخواتهم قال أفتحبه لأمتك قال لا والله جعل الله فداءك قال ولا الناس يحبونه لعماتهم قال أفتحبه لخالتك قال لا والله يا رسول الله جعل الله فداءك قال ولا الناس يحبونه لخالاتهم قال فوضع يده عليه وقال اللهم ارحمه اللهم اغفر ذنبه وطهر قلبه وحسن فرجه قال الراوي فلم يكن بعد ذلك الفتى يلتفت إلى شيء والحديث صحيح بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن العظيم ونفعني وإياكم لما فيه من الآيات وذكر الحكيم أقول ما تسمعون فاستغفر الله لي وفاستغفر الله ربكم منه كان غفارا الحمد لله وكفى وصلى الله وسلم على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد Imam Ahmad rahimahullah he has a narration that is collected in his book Al-Musnad with this chain of narration reaching the great companion Abu Umama Al-Bahili radiyallahu ta'ala anhu and in this hadith for those who do not speak the Arabic language and understand that Arabic language before we translate this hadith and break it down and dissect it piece by piece point by point, faida by faida, we say is that this hadith is a magnificent hadith. It's splendid and it is beautiful. It is a hadith that shines a great deal of light upon the beauty of the Nabi al-Karim alayhi salatu And it shines a great deal of light on the beauty of the Sahaba kiram, the noble companions. And it also shines a great deal of light upon the deen of al-Islam as a whole. This is a hadith that shows us how beautiful this man was, Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, and how beautiful his companions were, how knowledgeable they were, how righteous they were, how pious they were, and how much intelligence they were blessed with. But the hadith, brothers and sisters in Al-Islam, is not speaking about a companion who came and asked about prayer, a companion who asked about sadaqah, a companion who asked about hajj, a companion who said, what is the best deed? A companion who said, I wish to give all of my wealth for Allah's sake. I wish to go out with my sword and my spear and my shield and die as a martyr. The hadith does not say this. The hadith is not speaking about the most righteous, pious person. Yet and still, it shows us the beauty of three things or three components or elements. Number one, the beauty of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number two, the beauty of the Sahaba kiram. Number three, it shows us the great beauty of our Islam. How can this be, you may ask? It's not about salah, it's not about sadaqah, it's not about fasting, it's not about hajj, it's not about seeking knowledge, it isn't about jihad fi sabilillah, it isn't about things that seem to be righteous and acts of piety. So how does it shine light upon these three things? The hadith states, Abu Umayyah radiallahu anhu reported that one day, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu was sitting down and a very young man approached him. He says, Fatan Shabban, a young man. He wasn't older, he wasn't in his mid-thirties, he was very young. And he came to the Prophet and just imagine and stop and think, brothers and sisters, for one second on the psychology behind this hadith before I say it to you. And how you're going to be shocked. And some of you may be like, whoa, how is this? How can he say this? And even more shocking was the answer of the Prophet 
So imagine in the time of the Sahaba, people who were more righteous, more pious than us. So the young man, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said the following words. He said, it then leave zina. He says, allow me to make zina. Make it permissible for me to perform adultery and fornication. Just imagine this now. This is the Rasul of Allah among the Sahaba Kiram. And a young man comes up and he says, Oh Messenger of Allah, I want to make zina. And not only do I wish to commit the zina, but I want you to make it permissible and allow me to do it. Just stop and think about that for a second. What would most of us do? What would most of us say? How would most of us react? Look at what the narrator says. The people all turned towards him. What did you just say? Zina? Fazajaruhu. And they began to tap their legs and stuff for Allah like this. What many people would do. I would be like, how could you say this? Fazajaru. What did the Prophet والسلام, do? What did he say? Look at how beautiful he was. He said, Udnu, he says, come close, young man. Come near, move out the way, make room for this young man. The narrator says, so the man came very close to the Prophet والسلام, and then the Messenger of Allah he said the following words to this young man. He didn't say, fair law, it's haram, you go to the hellfire. That's not what he said to him. He says, Atuhibbuhu li ummika. He says, do you, are you pleased with people making zina with your mother? What did the young man say? La Allah. He says, by Allah, I would never be pleased with that. He says, may Allah make me the ransom for you. If something happened to you, if you were taken hostage, may I be the one that's given in your place. The Messenger of Allah والسلام, says, nor do people like it to be done to their mothers. The Prophet وسلم, he then asked that young man, that young boy who craved the zina, the haram. He says, do you like it for your daughter? Would you be pleased for someone to fornicate with your daughter? He says, no, by Allah, O Messenger of Allah, may Allah make me your ransom. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, says, no, do people like it for their daughters? The Prophet وسلم, he asked him a third time. He says, are you pleased with the zina for your sister? The young man says, of course not, O Messenger of Allah, may Allah make me your ransom. He says, nor do people like it for their sisters. The Prophet asked him a fourth time. He says, are you pleased with this, with your aunt, your paternal or maternal aunts? He said, no, of course, O Messenger of Allah, may Allah make me your ransom. He says, no, are the people pleased with this for their paternal and maternal aunts? The Messenger of Allah, والسلام, didn't place this blessed hand upon this young man. He touched him. Perhaps he touched him on his face. Perhaps he touched him on his head and he said the following words. He says, Allah oh Allah, forgive him of his sin. And cleanse and purify his heart. And protect his private area. Keep him chaste and safe from zina. The narrator then said that after the Messenger of Allah said those words and did that to him, the young man never ever looked or turned towards anything haram. Allahu Akbar. Look at the Prophet how wise he was, how intelligent he was, how beautiful he was. He didn't shun that young man. He didn't throw him out the masjid. But he did the exact opposite of what we would do today. He said, come close. Most of us would say, get out. Leave my home. Leave the masjid. How dare you ask this question? He says, come close. And then the Prophet he defeated this young man intellectually. He outwitted him. He used the word that we say, hikmah. Hikmah has no translation in the English language. It doesn't just mean wisdom. Hikmah is a word that cannot be rendered into English 101%. In the Arabic language, it's impossible. He used hikmah. He says, do you like it for your close women folk? And look at the young man, how even though he, made, he wanted to make zina, he still had a great deal of good in his heart. And he knew that zina was a bad thing. And he had jealousy, care, and concern for his women folk. And he says, La Allah. He says, By Allah, I swear I'm not pleased with that. And then he still had love for the Rasul. And he says, May Allah make me your ransom. So let's break down what do we benefit from this hadith, brothers and sisters? And what do we take from this in 2016? The first benefit we take from this hadith is the severe impermissibility of a zina. The next benefit we take from this narration is the beautiful akhlaq of the Rasul. As Aisha narrated, كان خلقه القرآن. His character was the Quran. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ 
When they call him a madman, a poet, a magician, a sorcerer, Allah says, Nay, kalla. You are upon an exalted standard of character. So what do the people say about the Prophet والسلام, And what do we say in response? We boycott them, we make a protest. Do we need to do this necessarily? If Allah, Rabbul Alameen, declared that he was upon Khulq Aleem over a thousand years ago. So the young man came to the Messenger of Allah والسلام, and we take from this is sabr, patience upon raising your children. Patience upon dealing with the youth in the masjid. Don't shun them. Don't push them out. Don't banish them, but do the opposite. Bring them close. Have sabr. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he asked him the following questions. And before we go that far, look how the Sahaba, look what they says, the companions, they knew that zina was bad. Yet still, look at the fiqh of the young man. He knew that zina was haram, but he still had the understanding that the only legislator was who? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And if Muhammad says zina was permissible, it is now permissible. In other words, not like many Muslims today who take other people besides Muhammad as legislators. This is halal, this is haram, because of what I say, what you say, your iman, your country, your culture, lack. That young man knew that zina was haram, and the only way it would be permissible if Muhammad وسلم, said it was halal. That's why he said, then leave. He says, allow me to do it. And look at the prophecies and understanding of the youth. He knew what was going on with the young man's mind and the young man's body. And this is how we should be with our young men and our young daughters. Talk to them, relate to them. Just yesterday, I swear by Allah, a young man whose name I'll leave anonymous, he says, I can't talk to my father. And his father is on the board of a masjid, the mu'adhin, the imam. And he says, I can't even talk to my father. My mother is nothing I can sit down and talk to her about. About my career, what I want to do when I get married. I can't even have a conversation with them. Where have we went wrong? How have we strayed from Muhammad Sallallahu beautiful guidance and the relationship that he had with the youth, the shabab, the future of Islam? Many of us, we have habits that very seldom will we get rid of, unfortunately. Many of us come from Jahiliya, from Kufr, things that you can't get rid of. Many of us were raised upon things that are very difficult to get out of. But the Shabab, the youth, they have a fighting chance. They have a fighting chance. So the process of gave Tarbi to this young man, he says the people do not love it for their mothers. And this part of the hadith that shows brothers and sisters the virtue of the mother in Al-Islam. And he didn't mention the sister, the daughter, the aunt. The first one that he mentioned was the mother, the Umm Mika. So what this tells us is that we should treat our mothers respectfully. We should be benevolent to them. We should be kind to them. We should have the utmost respect and regard for our mothers. And this hadith also shows us the paramount universal principle in the jazat and jins al amal. As we say in English, you get what goes around comes around. Or you get what you deserve. Or as some wise people say, you reap what you sow. The Prophet ﷺ says, if the people don't like it for their mothers, then why don't you like it for someone else's mother? In other words, when you make zina, when you make adultery, that's someone's mother. That's someone's daughter. That's someone's sister. That is a man's young baby girl. She grew up, she went astray, she lost her guidance, and then you're taking advantage of her. Just think about that. Would you like that for your daughter? Would you like that for your son? Would you like that for your family members? That is how the Prophet spoke. He spoke with hikmah. And most importantly, he addressed the people on their level of understanding. The Prophet after he engaged him and spoke to him, do you like it? No, so on and so forth. He then placed his hand upon the young man. And we know as Muslims, and we believe as Muslims, that the Prophet ﷺ was Mubarak. He was blessed. Everything about him was blessed. His speech was blessed. His physical body was blessed. His sweat, his saliva, everything about the Rasul ﷺ was blessed. And that is not the case with those who came after him. We do not make tabarruk with anyone other than Muhammad ﷺ. And the things that remain of Muhammad ﷺ's artifacts or relics or traces, we do not make tabarruk with those things as well. Because it's a very, very difficult, slim possibility that this is the exact place or the exact thing or the exact cloth. Only Allah knows. So the concept of barakah came from Allah. It was endowed to Muhammad ﷺ and he placed his hand upon the young man. And then he made dua for him. He said, oh Allah, forgive him of his sin. Look at the words of the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't say, fear Allah. He didn't say it's haram. He didn't have no need for those words. Because the young man was what? Intelligent. He was smart. He said, oh Allah, forgive him of his sin of thinking of zina. 
and purify his heart, cleanse his heart of those bad thoughts, of those evil thoughts. وَحَسِنْ فَرْجَهُ And protect his private area. Allow him to be chaste, to be shy, to be modest. And then what did the Prophet ﷺ, after he made that dua, the young man, which shows us his beauty, is that he continued to follow that nasiha. He continued to follow that dua, and he didn't turn to anything else. Not like us today, well, wait, wait a second, I need a year, I need a month, I need some more time, let me get my life together. I know it's haram, but I'm trying to... Ah. Allah says, the believers, the only statement that they make when they're invited to Allah and His Messenger, they say, we hear and we obey. Allah says, and they are the successful. They are the prosperous. The Muslims who submit and who lower themselves for Allah the Sublime and the Exalted. So this hadith is considered to be paramount for da'wah, for ta'leem, for tarbiyah, for your everyday nine to five living with your family members. Use intellect, make dua. Make dua, use intellect. Be wise with your son. Address your son, talk to your son. Do not belittle him. Do not belittle your children. Instill in them a sense of worth. Speak to them, talk with them, and most importantly, make dua that Allah will protect them, keep them safe, and guide them to the sirat al-mustaqeen, and allow them to stay steadfast thereupon. It is Allah the sublime and the exalted by His beautiful names and perfect attributes. We ask this to cleanse our hearts. I mean, we ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to protect our hearts and keep them safe from any misguidance. I mean, we beg that Allah the mighty, the majestic, will have mercy upon our poor souls in this life and in her after to have forgiveness for us. I mean, we beg that Allah the mighty, the majestic, will protect the Muslim youth and keep them steadfast from the many trials and tribulations of 2016. Allahumma ameen. Wa akhiru da'wana